Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, and we have uh, our panel here coming in from uh, various parts of the country. So we'll have each of them introduce themselves here shortly uh, so you can get to know the panel. Um, just two very quick points of logistics before we get started. Today's presentation is being recorded. You'll get an email shortly from me after we finish with the link to that recording. And please do share this with others in your organization. So I think they'll find the information as beneficial as, as hopefully you will. Uh, we will be fielding questions today. So if you have questions, feel free to submit those using the GoToWebinar toolbar. However, we have had a number of questions already submitted, which we have lined up. Uh, if we don't get to all the questions, um, we'll see if we can uh, address any of those offline. And one final uh, bit of logistics, as we're going through the presentation today, if you ever want to adjust the size of the slides versus the size of the webcams, there's a, uh, a line separating the two that you can adjust and make one bigger versus the other and go back and forth. So let me turn today to, uh, to our host, uh, Patrick Grau. Patrick is a principal Vice President and Senior Master Trainer with the TWI Institute. Uh, certainly one of the world's most experienced and knowledgeable TWI trainers, having learned TWI during his time uh, at Sanyo in Japan uh, during the 80s. He's also author of several award-winning books, uh, his most recent being uh, Creating an Effective Management System, Integrating Policy Deployment, TWI, and Kata. And certainly, just on a more personal note, Patrick has been uh, one of the, the longest and most consistent contributors to Lean Frontiers TWI Summit here in North America, as well as Europe. So Patrick, it's always great to have you here and great to have the panel along with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you very much, Dwayne, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. And yes, it's been a, a long uh, relationship and just really enjoy working with the Lean Frontiers group over many, many years. And they've been great supporters of uh, both the TWI Institute and TWI overall. Well, uh, welcome everybody and thanks for joining You know, our discussion today. It's my great pleasure to moderate uh, today's discussion um, in uh, uh, TWI and in, in healthcare, it's certainly a very timely topic. Uh, I don't have to explain the, the background of why we're here and what some of the things that we're doing, but boy, um, you guys are in for a real treat today because you're going to hear, you know, really from the front lines of of, of, of nursing, you know, in uh, during the pandemic. But more importantly than that, I think uh, not all of you, I understand, are from healthcare. But we all have healthcare, uh, you know, activities and implications and uh, results and. Um, effects in our in our daily lives. So you're going to be very familiar with all the topics that we've talked about. And I think because of the pandemic, we certainly have rollovers or uh, bleed overs into what's being done in healthcare versus what you're doing, you know, in your companies and your offices and your manufacturing uh, plants. But before we get started, uh, let me introduce to you today our uh, panel. We have three really excellent nurses and TWI trainers who I've had the pleasure of working with. They have been my senseis and teaching me about how to do TWI in healthcare. It's been a great education um, working with these uh, wonderful women over the last uh, many years. Um, first of all, we have uh, uh, Martha Purrier. Uh, Martha Purrier you know, has 34 years of experience as, as a nurse and she's been practicing most recently at the Virginia Mason Medical Center um, in Seattle. When I first met Martha, um, she was the director of the Kaizen Promotion Office, um, and that's how we kind of got working together on TWI. We authored a book on TWI called Getting to Standard Work in Healthcare, which we're actually working now on our second edition. Um, but most recently, for the last eight years, Martha has been the director of nursing at the Bailey Boucher House of Virginia Mason, which is a skilled nursing facility. And she's going to tell you much more about her work there when we get to, uh, to her. So welcome, Martha. Um, then we have uh, Judy Mann. Uh, Judy Mann um, is uh, uh, a registered nurse with 40 years of experience. Uh, she led um, uh, various aspects. I think there hasn't been a corner of the hospital that Judy hasn't worked in. Um, and she was working uh, at uh, Baptist Memorial Health, um, um, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, nonprofit um, medical, they have multiple hospitals throughout the Tri-State area centered in Memphis, Tennessee. And um, her final job before she retired at the end of last year 
was uh, Judy was the director of nursing and professional development uh, at the uh, Memphis Hospital, which is the flagship hospital at Baptist uh, Memorial. And Judy has received numerous uh, nursing awards over many, many years. So welcome, Judy. And then finally, we have Ginger Purvis. Ginger Purvis also was working uh, with Baptist. Jude, Ginger also has uh, uh, over 30 years of experience uh, as a registered nurse. In particular, she worked in oncology, in medical surgical nursing, also in nursing leadership. And uh, um, Judy, I'm sorry, uh, Ginger uh, worked in one of the Baptist hospitals, uh, which had over 300 beds uh, in northern Mississippi. And uh, as with uh, um, both Martha and Judy, Ginger led the introduction and the um, uh, development and management, you know, of TWI uh, in, in, in her hospital. So welcome, Ginger, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, and uh, let's move on to our, our topics. Now today, uh, before we get started, let me just get and give you a broad overview of what our discussion is going to be um, today. Um, here we go. Um, there's, there's our three ladies who we just introduced. And um, today, um, we would like to talk about um, TWI on the front lines of healthcare, but you know TWI um, didn't start uh, recently. For those of you who are familiar with um, TWI, um, you'll know that uh, it was started uh, in World War II um, when all of the men had to leave the factories and shipyards and uh, go off to fight the war, and uh, they were replaced by a new workforce. Many women, you know, for the first time coming into factories and shipyards. You know, this was the Rosie the Riveter era, and that was a big challenge in terms of changing the culture of how work was done in these workplaces. And, and the answer to that big challenge was TWI. TWI was developed, you know, by the War Department and uh, helped to train frontline supervisors in skills um, to, to get these new people in the workforce up and working very quickly and motivated to do all the jobs that, was, that were needed to win the war. And it was a big success. Um, after the war, TWI went all over the world, in particular went to Japan, uh, where it became foundational, you know, in the Toyota production system and still used today uh, as a core of that. Now, interestingly, for our discussion today, you know, we, I myself didn't find this out until many years later, during the wartime era, TWI was also used in healthcare. Um, as it turns out, you know, many doctors and nurses also shipped off to the war, and so they had the same needs in terms of getting a new, uh, new workforce up to um, speed. You can see a quote here from 1946, um, which shows you know, how effective and how influential um, all of the TWI modules of you know, job instruction, job methods, and job relations were to um, increasing efficiency and uh, decreasing the strain you know, of, uh, of the workforce. In, in fact, what we found then, not only uh, was TWI effective during the war, but it's still having great results um, today. So you can take a peek here at some of the, the results that we're getting um, uh, today you know, in healthcare um, facilities. And so what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to our panel and have them, uh, you know, why don't we just kind of um, get started by, um, maybe each of you can just tell us, just take a, without getting into all the details which come later, let's take like a 30,000 foot view level of what you're doing now and uh, you, know, um, you know where you're active today, uh, so you can maybe highlight a little bit of my introductions of each of you uh, to update that. And in particular, from that 30,000 foot level, just a quick you know hint of how TWI impacts um, patient care on the front lines, maybe it'll warm up uh, to our discussions uh, today. So um, Martha, would you like to start? Sure, I'd be happy to, thanks. Um, I am up here in Seattle, and this is where, you know, the uh, coronavirus first made its appearance, as far as we know, in the United States. And so I've been up here um, since the very beginning of that part of the, the start of the pandemic. And I would really sum it up by saying that um, TWI gives us a safe consistency to our care. And it really helps support the workers because this is a very, very scary time. And um, it's something wonderful to give your people the confidence to know that they're doing something right and they're doing something safe. And this is the best patient care. So um, I've been 
applying this, you know, really as fast as possible in the healthcare setting. And I am, uh, as of May, uh, practicing retirement. And so just trying to do as very little as possible, but um, there's still lots of work to do. Well, a well-deserved uh, break, as we'll find out as you get into more of the details. So thank you, Martha, for that. We'll get back to you soon. How about Judy? What are you doing lately? Hi. Well, um, I came out of retirement to begin working with TWI. Um, we are currently in Detroit, Michigan, as you can tell from behind us, two Southern girls. We've been here at a VA hospital that was a designated COVID hospital. Um, and we've been helping them understand the significance of standard work how applying standard work to tasks within healthcare from cleaning the floors to taking care of the most critical patient helps them feel more confident, helps them feel a lot safer, helps them provide the quality care that everyone in healthcare wants to have. Well, I'm glad to have you out there in action, Judy. We really appreciate you being there in Detroit. And uh, how about Ginger? You wanna give us a, just a quick minute on what you're up to these days? Absolutely. I've been uh, working with uh, Judy here in Detroit, also working uh, still at home in Mississippi uh, with Baptist and um, just helping everyone um, create a standard work, a consistent proven method. Um, so just like Martha, just like Judy have said, uh, to let the healthcare worker uh, feel confident in the jobs that they're doing and uh, to so also in turn, help the patient um, and help guide them and in, into the unknown world right now. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot of fear in the world and um, and they are looking to healthcare workers to provide that guidance and um, just so that they will be confident um, using standard methods. And that's what, that's what we're here in Detroit doing. That's what we've done at Baptist, uh, you know, just to help the worker uh, be confident and um, then, you know, help the patient, um, you know, be afraid to come and seek care. Okay, well, thanks, uh, ladies. Having said that, then let's let's just move right in then to our first topic, which is going to be frustrations uh, and pressures that you know we're seeing out there during this uh, this pandemic. Um, you know, to to kind of put uh, put some uh, high or uh, put a story behind what it is that we're talking about. What's actually going on? out there right now in terms of, you know, Ginger, you alluded to, you know, fear and frustrations and things like that. Could you tell us a little bit about your experience? We'll start with Ginger. What are what are the frustrating issues that you're seeing out there on the front lines? Well, um, in April, you know, things were changing rapidly in April. You know, um, COVID um, hit, hospitals were scrambling, um, emergency room were scrambling. We um, worked in the emergency room in the tent. I came, I worked one day. Um, we were doing COVID swabs uh, where we were um, asking the questions, what questions we were asking, um, where we actually put the swab, how many minutes it took to run down the swab to the lab. I came in the very next day and all of that had changed. Um, it was, frustrating to me as a healthcare worker that there was not a standard. Uh, and then I was afraid that we had done something wrong the day before. And maybe the, the people that um, we tested, we didn't test correctly and maybe the results weren't going to be um, um, a clear result. So it, it was frustrating. It was scary. Um, and there was not a standard there. And um, it was, it was, um, just a very scary time for the healthcare worker. Yeah, and I understand because uh, we talked at that time. You, know, you applied some TWI training. How did that look when you when you ran into that situation? Absolutely. When you when we put a standard in process, it was uh, it was very easy for the healthcare worker to know um, how to apply their gown uh, quickly, how to do the swab correctly to. They wanted to be able to provide those results to the um, the patient that had come and to safely um, and quickly and efficiently give those results to the patient. You know, and when we used TWI, they felt more confident, they were less frustrated, and it was easier 
to provide the training to the next nurse because some nurses were in the tent that had never worked in the ER. Uh, they were pulled from those outpatient areas that were closed. We closed all of the elective surgeries. And so they needed to be quickly and efficiently trained to be able to provide those services in, a, in an area they had never worked before. Mm. Yeah, you um, actually, Ginger, you just answered a question that had come in uh, previously about how, you know, TWI was dealing with people who got relocated from different areas of the hospital and had to work in a newer area. Um, Martha, let me turn to you because I know that you, uh, you know, you had worked really in a facility. You were in the facility there when the whole outbreak came out and, and there were a lot of things that you did you know, in order to deal with those frustrations and pressures. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that story. Sure. I think that, um, you know, one of the things is uh, our availability and accessibility to PPE was evolving and changing, as well as the recommendations for the use of the PPE and when to use what level. Um, recommendations were coming out um, from multiple sources. So we had about seven different sources. Um, some from the World Health Organization, from some from the CDC, some from our local public health authorities, because Seattle was uh, at the start of, of the pandemic. And so as these guidelines were coming out, um, PPE supplies and continuing even now, that um, kept evolving. And so our instructions on how to Don and Doff take on and take off the PPE correctly, for example, changed based on what equipment we actually had available. So if you're using a disposable gown, you need a place to, to throw that away. And do you take the gown and the gloves off at the end with it? You know, the sequence of doing that is slightly different than if it's a gown that you're going to send away to laundry and reuse. It's the same thing of, are you reusing your face mask? How do you clean it off afterwards if you have a face shield versus just a mask? And so um, we really needed to evolve our um, standard work around that and make it explicit to the equipment that we had at the time and the recommendations for use at the time, because that's a part of it. It's not just how to don and doff, it's when to don and doff. And when do you use what level of protection? And so we were able to take a fundamental standard work on how to use this and add in the nuances of the exact type of PPE that you were needing. So um, to the point that we've all brought up of the staff having the confidence in their methodology to keep themselves and their patients safe, it has to be down to the details. And this really allowed us to address that issue. Um, meaning TWI, you broke right. that down and you were able to train that consistent right. Uh, right performance. Right down to the hand motions. Down to the hand motions, yeah, right. exactly. Well, I, I think we all, you know, people watching all remember those days, you know, when PPP, PPE was not available and people were scrambling uh, and trying to understand, you know, should we wear a mask, should we not wear a mask? Those were difficult days uh, and, and, and continuing even to this day, I think. Um, Judy, let me turn to you because, Judy, you've worked more, you know, you've worked, not more, but you've worked a lot, you know, at the administrative sides of hospitals. How does that you know, these these frustrations, these pressures, um, how do we look at that in terms of, you know, uh, administration or management, you know, of the hospital? How do you factor in, you know, those pressures when you're trying to deliver, you know, safe and high quality health care? Maybe could you touch on that a little bit? I'd be happy to. You know, I think it correlates across the board, no matter what your profession is. You want to make sure that your workers feel safe, that they have the supplies that they need and that there is a minimum standard of work expectation so that they are safe and you know that they're providing safe care or a safe process. Um, and you have to do that as quickly and as flexible as you can. And that was one of the beauties of TWI, helping to take something that seems very complex 
and you begin to break it down piece by piece, standard work by standard work, and then you know just exactly like Ginger's frustration, you can pull someone into the tent. They can do the screening because they have the training that they need, although that may not be their expertise. Um, so having that high level to know that you've got the resources, that you have the what you need to train the people, which is what we even saw here. We had people coming in that could be put somewhere and what could they do? We provide them with the training to do so they can be safe and they can provide the care that we've designated for them to be safe. Actually, Jane, let me follow up if I could with you because you're talking about that management, you know, of the TWI system. We did have a question that came in that kind of aligns with what you're talking about. So, Judy, maybe you can follow up with this. And here's the question from one of our um, uh, um, attendees. It says, do you have to get alignment on the JIB, the job instruction breakdown? That's the notes that we use so that every person is trained the same way. So the question is, do you have to get alignment on the JIB across multiple shifts or even multiple hospitals? And are there any best practices that you have learned to help that alignment? I believe that you take the best you take the best practice, you take the science, the evidence, and you look at it. But you also have to look at your hospital or your your workforce and say, what works for us? In mm -hmm. a seven hundred bed hospital, is that going to be exactly the same way it looks in a thirty six bed hospital? Um, and it depends on what standard that you're talking about. A lot of things are regulatory. A lot of things are are governed. T that's the beauty to me of TWI. It takes it and it provides you with a roadmap so that you can be flexible enough based on what what you're dealing with, what size hospital, what size company you're dealing with, to have a standard. So the answer is yes to most degrees, but it is a very scientific-based breakdown that you develop. So it should be able to translate minor bit of tweaking to different uh, hospitals, different companies. And yeah, because, hygiene is a great Yeah, because you, you mentioned that, Martha. You you said that there were the, the standards were shifting from day to day, or as we learned more about the virus, we learned other things. So really that flexibility that the JIB, the job instruction breakdown gives you, and then the, the, the quickness of the training. Was that helpful, Martha, as you went through the, because you were in more of a, um, almost like a, what do you what do you call that? Like a, I don't want to say a nursing home, but it's that, that similar situation, right, where you had people there uh, on a regular basis, which is really where the crisis started, right? Yeah, we had um, we have have a population that is um, in the same building, both a skilled nursing facility. It, Bailey Boucher House was designed as the first hospice for people with AIDS. And it's evolved now for um, other immunocompromised patients or people who need a very high level of skill, especially at end of life like ALS, Huntington's disease, et cetera. So we had that inpatient population that was super vulnerable, but we also have a 380 person outpatient program that are all HIV positive. And the, the goal of that program is to um, get uh, consistency in medication adherence so that we lower the viral loads. That population in our outpatient program, there's also a, a emergency shelter. And so we really had a hot spot potential for um, activity within, you know, our building. And we had the higher scrutiny of regulation from um, CMS for nursing home regulations. So we had CMS, CDC, World Health Organization, Public Health, Virginia Mason, infection preventionists. We had a, a lot of people weighing in on what, what to do when. And so um, it really took a lot of effort to take in all of these recommendations that were coming out every single week, things were differing. And to not have everybody just freak out that Nobody knows nothing, and we're all just, you know, winging it. <laughs> more than just winging it, just flying, flying by the seat of our pants. And it's just by chance that bad things haven't happened. And so, really, TWI gave us a lot of um, stabilization. 
and settling down, which really created capacity for us to think about the next thing coming. So I took, I'm going to take just a second here, but I kept a log of what we did on what days and every single day we were doing different things and things were evolving so fast. And in March we had, um, the first week in March, we are drawing out the flow and the standards required for care of the patient who exhibited symptoms, whether or not they were positive yet or not. And so we had that figured out. And then um, it was eight days later, we had a patient have those symptoms. And it was uh, 16 days from the time we drew it up that we had our first positive patient. And so we were ready. We had a chance to practice that. And the same once um, the um, our oversight organization, the DSHS, came out with standards for our facility, and they were going to come and do kind of like a joint commission audit of survey, mini survey to our organization. They posted all the recommendations on, um, it was March... Uh, six and on March or April 16th on April 6th they posted the recommendations this is all the things you need to be doing and on April 16th we had our survey and but we were already ready because we had already been working on all these problems and so yes we were able to adapt rapidly but we were also able to create because we were working on standard work we could just tweak it and that created capacity for the leadership to think about the next thing that might come and might happen for us. And this was huge to create capacity for us. And I think that's one of the beauties, you know, of uh, TWI, because it, like your ladies are, all of you are saying is that, you know, people have this con concept of standard work as, you know, oh, this detailed SOP where you have to do it exactly, you know, it's inflexible and that's why we don't use them. But actually it really gives us that flexibility where we can create that stability of performance. Wow, that's great. Okay, well, let's let's move on to our next topic, which is um, managing for metrics. You know, many times, uh, you know, as we're doing these activities, um, you know, we, you know, as as the saying goes, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? And so, what are those metrics that we're looking for in in hospitals? That would be things like, you know, hospital born, hospital acquired infections, or maybe length of stay or readmission. So. You know, from a more broader point of view, um, not just focusing on the on the uh, the COVID um, uh, pandemic, but um, maybe Ginger, you could just tell us as a frontline nurse, what are some of the metrics that matter to nurses and caregivers? Things that we could measure, you know, when it comes to this type of standardized work. Uh, we always want to make sure that um, in the hospital, when we're discharging a patient, that uh, they are going to understand what their medicine is, when they're, ret when they're gonna return to uh, the, either the clinic uh, for um, their chemotherapy or when they're scheduled to go back to have lab work done. So it's very important as a nurse uh, that we do a lot of education um, and not being very you know, robotic um, about what we're telling our patients, but giving them that structure, that's what TWI does. And, the job breakdown, it gives them a structure for the nurse to remind them um, and instruct them on their medication when they're expected to uh, return to the clinic. Um, always uh, reminding um, that worker to thank that patient and get, let them know that we appreciate that they have chosen to come to our organization. So it, it gives them the flexibility to be um, their person, and um, but it also gives them and hits those key points and those uses those key words of what they, we want that particular patient to remember about discharge or, or about medication. Um, so just like a job instruction on uh, discharging a patient, a job instruction on reminding a patient to come back to the hospital. Even with COVID, we've um, a lot of people have been fearful of coming into the hospital um, or to seek treatment. And so we want to, when we're reminding them of their appointment, um, to tell them who they're seeing, when they're seeing, and the, uh, what day and what time, but also reassuring that 
veteran or reassuring the patient of what we're doing to keep them safe during the pandemic. So those are just a couple of uh, jobs that, uh, you know, breakdowns that we've seen that we've helped them work with. Also um, in using with our nursing educators on a checklist um, through job instruction on how to observe someone taking off their PPE to keep them safe. Just like Martha was saying, they did a lot of the donning and the doffing. We help the nursing educators um, through job instruction on how to observe someone doing that and keeping them safe. So we can we can track whether the, everyone's following the, the standards or not. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we can coach them uh, when they need coaching. Right. Yeah, because without that, we, we can't maintain that consistency, right? We can Absolutely. teach them, but how do we get them to follow up and make sure they're following those those good procedures? Well, and when when you use the four-step method, you're preparing that worker and you're letting them know why it's important. And you're giving them the reasons for those, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the key points and letting them really understand why it's important to uh, pull away your gown and to roll it up. You know, those are key points, but they're very important and, and it protects the worker and in turn protects their family. And so um, letting your learners understand the reasons why is uh, a huge part of um, the TWI web. Great. So let me let me move over to you, Judy, because uh, I'll let you follow up with that. Because you know, Ginger is really focusing on those frontline. Here's what the nurses really care about. But from an administrative point of view, you know, we often hear, you know, it's very important for hospitals in terms of spiraling, you know, costs and how do we maintain costs and you know uh, how can we maintain that customer, you know, patient satisfaction and safety at the point of care. You know, could you talk a little bit about those measurements as well? How do we manage those metrics from a more of a higher, maybe a management level? Oh, certainly. You know, you can go anywhere on the web and find out about where a patient, where a hospital stands with their patient satisfaction. Um, and that is correlated and tied into reimbursement with the government in a multitude of different ways. Um, so that's a metric that you have to watch, but you can't really you know, you can't really be strict on the script. You just have to provide the structure of the script because each individual is different. Each individual uses their own personality. Plus you have the personality of the patient and the, the, the family. So that's the beauty of this in that it allows enough individual personality, but yet you have the standard message that you want, um, which is very important in today's world, no matter where you are, if you're a, a waitress or if you're a frontline worker or if you're serving hot dogs on a vendor, you want to make sure that you have good customer service. And so that's one of the things that we monitor metrics on. Um, of course, you know, your infection rate will, you know, that's another thing we want to, to make sure that you monitor. But, you know, if you're looking at it from the high level, what can TWI do for me? It can help you change your culture. It can help you change your workforce methodology processes, and it can provide that standard that people feel comfortable working within so that you can hit the metrics that you're wanting, which is one of the things that we're working with the VA hospital that we're at right now. And they are meeting the metrics that have been set. So it's, it's a proven methodology to have the outcomes that you're looking for. So we have things like you know, costs and infection rates with drive up costs. Martha, what other metrics have you seen that, you know, really TWI can drive in terms of measuring the results of, you know, all these efforts? Sure, I think that um, TWI can impact all of the metrics that we see in healthcare that um, we're held accountable to, such as um, central line infection rates and falls, patient falls and falls with injury um, readmission rates, um, time it takes for specific procedures to happen from the time of presentation in the emergency room, such as with somebody who has symptoms of uh, either a stroke or a heart attack. We measure these metrics and as a healthcare um, organization, we're, these are national out, outcomes and clinical um, clinical results of outcomes and TWI works for all of this. I think, you know, we have our clinical outcomes over here and then you have your 
best practice standard work here that you're saying, if we're doing this, we'll get this. And um, standard work is just a hypothesis of how do you get to this. <laughs> and that's what's so great about TWI is this is the roadmap to get to this. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, all of our metrics, all of our clinical outcomes, none of those have changed even in the face of the pandemic. It's just a, a different challenge and a different way to get to these things. These are still the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about that flexibility that TWI gives you so that you can really flex with the different requirements of the day or the changing pandemic situation and so right. on. I, I also think that, um, you know, there's these, these clinical outcome metrics that all of our organizations have figured out how to measure, whether it's by chart review or insurance claims or um, just noting the infections as they come back from laboratory. You know, we have a way to collect this data but the TWI method gives you even more at the this level where you're trying your hypothesis of this is the standard work that's going to get us to this outcome. There's a way with TWI and the methodology of coming back and checking on the results and being able to check that the standard work is being followed and being done exactly how it was taught, that's part of the four-step method. And um, that gives you reliability. Mm -hmm. And you will never know if your hypothesis of your standard work is working to give you the results you hope it's going to give you until you've established reliability. Yeah. Well, here's a, let me just throw in a question uh, from the um, from the audience. Uh, let me toss this one to Ginger because they're, they're asking some specific questions. We're talking about standard work and, you know, processes and, and, the, and the, 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 the participant asked this question. He said, what specific jobs uh, do you panelists see the hospitals in terms of writing your, you know, JIBs, your job instruction breakdowns, whether it's in the class or outside of the training? In other words, what job instructions did you use for what jobs? Could you give us some examples of that, Ginger? Uh, like uh, Martha's already mentioned, uh, donning and doffing uh, the PPE. Um, we are working currently on um, breakdowns for return to clinic orders. Uh, the pandemic threw um, a huge curve into all of the doctor's office visits. You know, people weren't coming to visits. They stopped. They started having virtual visits. So we're working on a return to clinic order we've worked on um i'm trying to think what some uh, some cleaning of equipment uh, judy and dick have worked with the ems on uh, cleaning equipment cleaning wheelchairs we worked on a screening process when you walk into the hospital what questions should they ask um we worked on um with the mental health program we also worked on how um, they should ask the questions. It's not only are you paying your rent, but are, is your rent current? So job instruction can go from hospital. It can go to an outpatient setting. It can go to manufacturing. Um, it can go to a restaurant, just like Judy mentioned, a restaurant of how I'm going to deliver drinks to a table uh, successfully. Successful. <laughs> safely that I don't get anybody wet when I drop my tray in your lap. You know? So those are specific jobs, uh, if that answers your uh, okay, great. question. So I think, yeah, I think what we're seeing is that job instruction isn't just for those, you know, those clinical, you know, how to change a dressing or how to, you know, draw blood, you know, from the blood cultures or so on. Is that right, Martha? Yeah, I wanted to um, also throw in there that um, with the doffing, being so important because that's really a, a risk of contamination. If you think that the equipment that you have on is possibly, you know, contaminated with whatever virus or infectious agent that you're working on. We even wrote um, a job instruction for the person who watches the person taking off the equipment. And we titled that job a officer, <laughs> which was very fun. 
Well, let's move on to our next topic, uh, and uh, uh, we're going to be talking about change and and also our final topic, which is very similar to that, uh, which is culture change. And and in fact, uh, the question I have a question from the audience. I'll just we'll just pick that up right up with you, Martha. Uh, the question was, uh, you know, who facilitates that change? Is it a, a process improvement team? Is it the managers? Because we know that change isn't easy. And you've experienced that both in the regular hospital when we were rolling out TWA as well as the pandemic. But what kinds of problems, you know, are created when we change these procedures? And we've got a picture uh, from your experience up on the slides there. You can talk to that. Right. Yeah. This is um, this is a picture of one of um, our staff members being photographed as uh, wearing PPE when you have a reusable gown and goggles and so and the job breakdown essentially is to the right of that we created a, a standard look for those things and then right above it is the picture of when it's a um, disposable gown and before that and so we um, you know, changing rapidly or ch change in general is not a comfortable thing for people. And if you're changing in an environment like we are experiencing right now, there can be confusion, anxiety, stress, divisions, a lot of swirl. And by swirl, I mean people talking to each other. So it's kind of a circular thing. And it's a lot of emotion and rumors and blame and anxiousness. And nobody's really got the answers because it's kind of a lateral swirl thing like between shifts. You can even have mutiny where people either decide I'm not doing this anymore or they quit or even I'm not doing that job or um you know, in the, the earlier days of um, care for patients who had AIDS, people could actually refuse the assignment of taking care of somebody out of just their own principle. And, you know, I'm really happy that healthcare has moved beyond that. We now understand that this is our ethical and professional responsibility to provide care for people. But um, change can be very difficult. And, um, being able to include as many people as possible, but not bog it down is the balance that you're trying to get. So who leads change? Is it the frontline manager? Is it the process improvement team? Is it the education team? Is it the, the clinical specialists? And um, you know, my response to that as a, a leader is that I'm, I'm the captain but I need to assemble a wonderful cabinet. I need to get um, as much diversity as possible and still keep us moving. It's not 100% democracy of, I don't need to get every single person's opinion, but I need to get a sampler of people who are gonna help me be champions of this methodology. Hey, Ginger, let me toss that to you because just following up with what Martha's talking about, I know you train job relations, the job relations component, you know, of TWI, and also you've looked at job methods. How does how does how does TWI talk to those issues that Martha just mentioned about, you know, getting the team together? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, with job relations, you have you, you know your four foundations, and that's what we teach with job relations, and um, we want every supervisor. Um, every manager to have those and use those four foundations um, and we you know have that whole class of job relations but uh, it really that person know how they're doing and if they're not putting on the PPE correctly you need to let them know hey and let them know right where they are you don't want to do a hey, great job and then them take get COVID or take COVID home with them or you want them to um, let people know in advance as much as possible what's going to happen. You know, if there's train new training coming up, or if we're going to do something a different way than they've been doing it all these years, you know, um, you want to, people to know that that training is coming, that it's different. And then through job methods, changing, um, looking at processes, uh, we looked at um, changing our supply rooms uh, um, at 
the hospital that I worked in and we really looked at our unit a totally different way and it went to one supply room down down from four down to one. But what that process, we didn't we went back to the four, but through job methods and looking at the whole process, we were able to rearrange, eliminate some of our supplies that were on our supply carts. So it would make the um, stalker be able to scan efficiently because what we found is we were asking them to do an impossible task. They had been saying that, but we weren't listening. And so when we went and walked through the process with them, we found that an eight, uh, a 12 hour job we were asking them to do in about six hours. And mm -hmm. we found that we needed to rearrange and um, um, change our supplies, eliminate some of the supplies. And what that did for our job relations with the people that worked in the materials area, they were heard and they were listened to. And it, it, it really um, empowered those people and their voice was heard. And um, so through job methods and job relations, um, we, you know, empowered our, um, you know, our stalkers and they were, you know, like I said, their voice was heard and that made them feel important. Yeah, and TWI gives you, gives them the skills to be able to do that, you know, effectively. Hey, Judy, Absolutely. let me toss you a question. Here's a question from the audience. Uh, uh, again, following these same lines about change and how you manage that, but this is a specific question that came from the audience. Did you have to, in your role as educator, did you have to teach TWI to managers first, or did you incorporate TWI training into the overall change initiative? Could you talk maybe a little bit about how do you roll that out in that change process? Um, how you start to make that, you know, the, the, um, the, the C-suite understands the process. They need to know what the work is. They need to know what the training is all about. Um, and so with job relations, of course, you want to start there. You want to start there and then work your way down so that everyone sees the modeling from the person above them. And then they understand that this is not just more rhetoric that they're hearing, but they're actually seeing the action in place. With job instruction, you can start with the front line. And so they are, depending on the skill that you've opted to work on, um, it really depends on which one of those skills you want to work with. You can have them going simultaneously at the top, you know, at the front line. You know, we're working with EBS. We've worked with nursing units. We've worked with the ED. So you can, <coughs> you can pinpoint where you want it to go. With job methods, that can start at any point in time. What you're looking for there is efficiency, and you're looking for more than anything to hear from the staff about what is inefficient. They know, they have the answers. We're just providing dedicated time for them to walk us through their job and for us to be able to rearrange, reorganize, eliminate. Um, so it, it, is, you know, it is up and down the process. And to me, that's the beauty of TWI. It's not top down. It's not, I'm going to tell you how to do this and you're going to do this. It is a lot of collaboration and a lot of input. But the, what proves it is people see. They see you doing whatever it is, whether you're having a relationship and we're going to have a crucial conversation, whether I'm giving you feedback, whether I'm showing you how to do a task. There's a lot of input that has gone in this. It's not a solo motion. Yeah. And if I could, let me just uh, point out to the audience that, you know, this, uh, what we're talking about here is not new age psychology. We put this together in the 1940s, the early 1940s, you know, so I think it's just good common sense of how you work with people, right? And then we knew this, and this is going back to the 40s even before that. This is not new age psychology, you know, just good common sense practices. And I really like what you said, Judy, because I agree with that. You know, the people have the answers. They just don't have a format or a skill to roll that out. They, they kind of intuitively know what needs to be done. But what TWI gives them and our leaders then is the skill to lay that out and be able to be able to recognize where those opportunities are so that we have then the skill to roll out that standard and then take apart, going back to what Martha originally said, if we don't get people to participate, you know, in those activities, then we'll never really have their buy-in. And so the core, you know, to standard work is to get people's willingness, you know, their willingness to follow those standards. And that takes lots of skill, you know, which we uh, pass on, you know, in the 
in the TWI delivery. And that's a really nice segue into our last and our final uh, topic here as we come to the end of our hour. But you know, when you talk about all of these things, uh, change and you know how do we react to crises and so on. Really, it, it, we're really talking about uh, culture. Am I right? And so, Martha, this is another picture. You can talk to us a little bit about this. That it's not just the physical environment, right? It's the 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 culture of the people. I think that's what we're getting at. Um, but you 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 observe this uh, you know this effect of culture on care. You live that you know in these early days of the pandemic, but. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about the early day, the early phases of shaping that culture and and, and how TWI helped you there? Yeah, this is um, a picture you can see on the far right. You see the multiple different um, job breakdowns for the different PPE that I was speaking about. And um, we posted them. We trained people. We had a... Um, <clears throat> we had a... Sorry. Um, a training for this. We created a space for the training. We had a notebook where these could be, you know, referenced, a safe place to keep them. But we just made it really visible and we made also visible the use of uh, different team members in our pictures and our spaces. We took um, some PPE cards and we had these for um, a variety of infection types and we would just post what type what card of like is this a respiratory isolation or a contact precaution isolation and you had in the drawers the different PPE needed and we anticipated needing a lot more carts for a lot more patients and so we kitted out the carts unique to the um, the PPE that we thought we were going to use which was contact droplet precautions and so we set it all up and then we you know sealed it off with blue tape and we lined these all up in our previously used dining room which was now you know there's no group activities and so we created this big environment of really visible ready room for the PPE and I think you know uh, culture is everything and we've already touched on the willingness to contribute and that's what you really want from your people that's what your culture looks like and so i think when you're you know really trying to influence culture you need you know three major things and one is a really clear unwavering commitment to that clear vision of what does it look like what are we trying to do and the second thing you need is um a plan to get there and incremental steps and this is exactly where TWI fits so well it gives the leader something to do on the gimba not just check and chit chat and how's it going but it gives you that work and that reason to be there that legitimacy to to be visible leading that change and the last thing is you know the willingness to have maybe some hard conversations um, as a leader with people of uh, the consequences of failure to follow that standard work of like, you no, know, the commitment is there, mm -hmm. but you really want the emphasis on that second piece, which is get everybody together, get them there, have that incremental work laid out and invite people to the table to participate in that. That always is such a better carrot. Yeah. So, in, and you can, we can see that in the early stages of the change that you went through, but long-term, let me throw this back to, um, to Judy, longer term, because I know, you know, your work over many, many years, uh, I know at Baptist, you called them shepherding groups, but you really put a big effort into not just getting things going, but how do you maintain that? What were some of the points that you could, as we kind of come down in our final minutes, how do you, how do you make this longer lasting than just a flavor of the month, you know? Or, oh, we responded to the crisis, now the crisis is over, it's back to business as usual. You're exactly right, because what you normally hear is you just need to go re-educate, re-educate, re-educate. And that's not necessarily the truth. You need to make sure that you sustain this. So you can find, uh, form any type of, we call them shepherds. They could be a governing body. They could be a, um, a, a committee, whatever anyone wants to call. But you have to get representation from all areas. And you want to have people that have a passion, a passion for doing the right thing correctly for the right reasons. Uh, because change is fearful and change is hard. 
Um, and so this group is there to do the observations, to ask the tough questions, and then to get the correct people in the room to get the correct breakdowns. Um, so monitoring how your, your workers are working, monitoring how your staff is doing, how are the relationships, you know, what are the, um, what are, what unit do you need to work on? What line do you need to work on? Because their output is not what it needs to be. You know, what if you're having a safety issue? Then this shepherding group is the one who steps in and says, have we had a breakdown? Have we had a change? Do we have a new product? Do we need to provide new training? Um, or where are we with our training? Um, sometimes you have to have someone who is the constant little tickler to say, how you doing? How's it going? Um, and we're seeing that everywhere we go, you have to have the follow-up. So they are the follow-up group. They're, they're the instigator of new processes, but they're also the follow-up to make sure that people are doing what they need to be doing and they're continuing in their standard work. I think that we see that in COVID more than anything is you have the letdown. Now the crisis is over and everybody wants to return to normal. Well, in my opinion, there is no normal. The normal is what we're in now. Um, it, whether you're riding on a plane, that's a new normal. If you're going through McDonald's, now you have touchless. So everywhere you're going, you have to establish a new norm and that's the day that we're at. This is a good group to help you establish what that's gonna look like within your facility, within your hospital, within your company, and to keep you on the path so that the standard work remains standard and the variations don't continue to cause the clutter, as I call it. Yeah. Well, and it, it sounds a lot like coaching, because I know that at Baptist, you, I know a lot of our viewers are familiar with Toyota, Toyota Kata and the coaching routines, and those were also really helpful, were they not in that effort? Oh, they were. Kata was a big, a big participant of it. It was, it goes hand in hand, in my opinion. Right. Um, that coaching continues, and we're, we're doing that even here. You know, we're coaching the people that we initially trained. We come back and follow up with them. How are you doing? You know, do what questions do you have? What roadblocks did you hit so that we can help them get those roadblocks down? Because often the staff hits them and they're like, whoop, I'm done, that's it. So if you're there to come back and check with them or to coach them um, mm -hmm. and mentor them after you've coached yeah. them, continue to challenge them to grow them. Because as, as good, as good as the TWI programs are, they're not a silver bullet. They take a lot of effort, right, uh, to, to follow through. Okay, well, we're kind of coming to the close of our hour, but Ginger, just so maybe we started with you. Why don't you, do you want to make any final comments about how culture, you know, relieves that? We started talking about emotional strain and the stress, and, and how does culture and affect, you know, that stress when, you know, you talked about stability and uncertainty and so on. Do you want to just give us a few final comments on that? Absolutely. Um, it just uh, creates a team effort, you know, a team, uh, you know, it, it strengthens your team when they have something uh, reliable um, and they're confident. Uh, so your um, TWI is given, um, as we have worked here with the VA, we've already seen their confidence build um, and uh, they've already made great uh, strides, whether it's that's in the mail um, program with the pharmacy or when they are trying to house veterans, they've already seen their metrics move and it gives them um, confidence during this fearful time and they're ready to move to something else. And so they're saying, what can we do next? You know, <laughs> look how this works, you know, yeah. and so they're excited. It starts a fire. And yeah. uh, just like we started with the, um, with the uh, Kata, they, they're very overwhelmed with a challenge, you know, and we all know the analogy of the elephant, you know, you have to eat the big elephant, you know, we just have to start one piece at a time. And they've already, uh, like I said, uh, build the, they built their confidence. We gave them the knowledge, but it was up to them to use that skill and build their skill of the instruction. And that's what they're doing right now. And they've seen some success and they are, they are on fire. Well, that's a real high note to to end on. Thank you for that, Ginger. And let me just we, we got to call this a wrap, guys. We could be talk we could talk all afternoon about these things, uh, but uh, we're limited to an hour. So uh, just let me say a big thank you uh, 
to our participants. And I know we, we were only able to address a, a few of the questions, but what we'll do, um, uh, Dwayne, as you come back on and wrap up is we'll, um, we'll answer all those questions and we'll send them out um, to the participants. All right, yeah, and with that, that we'll great. turn it back to Dwayne. Yeah, they, uh, you know, to all the panelists, thank you so much uh, for the time you took today to share some of these stories. Uh, very powerful stories and uh, great examples of uh, the impact TWI can have, TWI in action. And I, I'm always, after something like this, scratching my head thinking, why isn't everyone using TWI? But <laughs> th thank you at least for uh, sharing your stories as to why you're, you're using it and, that, and what you're getting out of it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, today's presentation has been recorded. Uh, so if you look for an email shortly, uh, within an hour or so, um, you'll find a link to view the recording. Um, I also mentioned that uh, Patrick has been a regular participant in the TWI Summit as well as the Kata Summit. Um, I put a link in there on that email. So if you'd like to find out more information about those, feel free to do that. I also okay. put a link to the TWI Institute in that follow-up email so you can learn more about the Institute by following that link as well. So thanks again to the panel. Thanks for everyone who participated in our session today. Have a great day. Now go do good things. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.